So, hi. Uh, today I will talk about how we made an app to bring coffee tasting to rural areas with Ember and Cordova. So, my name is Francesco, and I will talk about coffee and Ember and a little bit of Cordova. And I hope at the end of my talk you will have a rough idea of some things that you can maybe avoid when you work on a native app or like some tips and tricks that we learned along the way when building our own app. So I live in the lovely city of Innsbruck in Austria. It's really, really nice there, also worth a visit. Um, I work for Cropster, and what we do at Cropster um, is we try to make the lives of coffee producers all around the world easier. So most of our customers are coffee roasters, small coffee roasters, but some of them are also importers, exporters, or farmers, for example. Um, actually, Amsterdam is a great place to get good coffee, with awesome small roasteries like Bocca Coffee, White Label Coffee, Back to Black, Manhattan Coffee Roasters, etc., etc. Um, they are all located in or around Amsterdam. Check them out. Um, these small coffee roasters uh, like to get their coffee through so-called direct trade, um, which means that they fly to origin countries, um, which are usually in Latin America, Asia, or Africa. So they fly there and go to farmers um, to try to get the best possible coffee for them to roast later. So it's a very manual thing, and it has a lot of, to do with relationships. And this process involves a lot of coffee tasting, um, which is also called cupping, when we talk about coffee. So that's me at a cupping. I'm not super good at it, still learning, but experts in this area really treat coffee tasting much like people taste wine. So you would say something like, this coffee has a sweetness of nine and an acidity of 8.5, and it has notes of apple and berry, and the aftertaste has notes of citrus, things like this. It's kind of considered an art, and people are pretty intense about it, also because it's really important for the actual coffee that they will then produce. So the way that this used to work is um, you have a table, roughly like here, with a lot of cups on it. And then in one hand, you have a cupping spoon, which is a special spoon that you use to taste the coffee. And then you kind of tuck a piece of paper here and a pen in the other hand, and you walk around the table, taste the coffees, and write down your notes on a piece of paper. Um, now that's nice, I guess. But then what do you do with that paper? Um, so often, you just kind of file these forms, and then they gather dust, and you never do anything with it again. Um, another option is to then later put the data into a computer system so that you can do some kind of report with it. And that's also what we used to offer at Cropster. So we have an online system, a software as a service, where people can enter quality-related data for their coffee and then later run reports on it. And that was fine, I guess. It worked. But it really felt still really tedious that we required people to write these things on paper just to later put it in a computer. And since we are a software company, we thought, yeah, we can improve this. Uh, we could make an app for that. So first, we thought, what are the requirements for us in this case? So the first one is it needed to run on iOS and Android. Most of our users use iOS, but not all of them. And we wanted to be able to include all of them, so it needed to run iOS and Android. Then a very important thing for us was it needed to be fully offline capable. Uh, the reason for that is, as I mentioned, people might fly to, I don't know, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and taste coffees there. And the possibility that they have a very spotty or even non-existing internet connectivity there is pretty high. But this cupping data is very, very valuable to our customers, to the coffee roasters. Because just imagine you fly to Colombia, then you taste some coffees, then you fly back home, and you collected all that data on your device, and once you have internet connectivity, your data is lost, there is no way to ever get the data back because you cannot just replicate the tasting. So we really designed this whole app around the idea of being offline first. The next point was maintainability. We're a pretty small team. We are three front-end developers, and we also have to maintain some other Ember apps. And we really wanted to be able to maintain this app without having to hire new developers for iOS and Android. 
And the last point is the app needed to actually be easy enough to use that people would prefer it over paper. A uh, small side note, we've heard a bit about progressive web apps um, today and yesterday, and why did we not use a progressive web app? Well, first of all, we started work on this app like three years ago. Um, at the time, our target browser was iOS 8, Safari, um, which basically didn't support anything that you would need for a progressive web app, so it wasn't really an uh, option at the time. But we revisited the decision this year, and we still decided that we're not yet ready to move to a progressive web app. And now it's not really about technical issues, it's really about workflow issues. So our users are not very technical people, but they know how to install an app. Like go to the app store, search for the name of our app, download it, done. And they kind of trust this workflow and they know that then if they go to the app, it's offline, capable, and they trust it that it will keep the data safe. Whereas for a progressive web app, it's a bit like, how do you explain this to someone? Go to this website, then wait a bit, and then it's offline capable if you have a browser that supports all the things. And then if you're offline, just go to the website and it will work. I know how it works, but it's kind of difficult to communicate to our users. Also, it doesn't feel as secure as a native app. So even though I know, yeah, it will keep my data safe, our users don't feel that way. So, see how well, oh, okay. Um, this is basically the app we then build. It's called Crops the Cup. On the left-hand side, you can see a paper cupping form. That's how, uh, what people use to enter the data. You can see there are a lot of things in there. Actually, these forms are very flexible, so every company might use a slightly different form, so it's actually customizable, but that's the most common one. And then on the other side, you can see the same cupping form in our app. Um, you can see that we try to stick to similar visual style, that it feels natural, um, but we really tried to... Um, oh, it just doesn't start videos, I guess. Oh, perfect. So you can see that we tried to use like very touch-friendly interaction patterns. Um, we made, like we used sliders as much as possible. Uh, in the beginning, we thought about using drop-downs, but they kind of suck. Um, so yeah, we're now quite happy and it's rather easy to use with one hand, which was important because remember, people have a spoon in one hand while doing this, so they only have one hand free. So it's important that you can kind of do it all with one hand. So for the rest of my talk, I want to talk about a couple of things that we learned along the way, which can be summarized as mobile app development is hard. Um, so in specifically, I want to talk about data storage, transactionality, operating offline, fluid performance, testing on real devices, native development, app stores, and native deployment. Don't worry, most of it will be rather short. Um, so let's start with data storage. So, as I mentioned, we started out with the assumption that the app needs to be offline first. Um, so we thought, remember it was three years ago, how can we store our data on the device? Uh, it was iOS 8, support for IndexedDB was very bad, um, so we decided on using local storage. Um, really easy to use, even at the time there was a nice to use Ember data adapter for it, and it just worked, cool. However, it didn't really work once we deploy it because, I mean, it feels kind of obvious now, but local storage basically is a key value store. Um, so we ended up stringifying the whole database every time we saved. So uh, the more data we had, the longer this took. In addition, local storage is also synchronous. So basically every time someone changed something, the app started to hang. Um, I wouldn't call it a great experience. Um, so we thought, how can we improve this? And we ended up revisiting our decision to not use IndexedDB. By the time Safari, what is it now? iOS 9 came out, which had a at least workable IndexedDB support. And we decided to rewrite our whole app, drop support for um, iOS 8, and use IndexedDB instead. Uh, so we wrote our own Ember add-on. It's called Ember IndexedDB. You can use it. Um, and this uses DexCGS. I don't know whoever of you have, has ever worked with IndexedDB, but if you have, you probably know that 
the API is very weird, at least it was to me. It's very hard to work with it for me. And DexyJS makes this much nicer. But anyhow, if you use Ember InxDB, this is also abstracted away from you. The way it works is that you define your stores, which is basically your database, um, where you just can defi define all the fields that are indexed and thus queryable. And that's basically it. After that, you can just interact with it through your store. Um, so the way our app was built is that it, the whole app just interacts with IndexedDB. It, everything is always IndexedDB through the store, and there's really just one pull and one push function, basically, that interacts with the API. So it's only slightly simplified, I guess. The load data function really just uses Ajax to fetch some stuff, and then the IndexedDB service has a method to just add this data to IndexedDB, and that's it. And then in the rest of the app, we just use like all the store methods we're used to. We can do find all, you can do query, which will actually query on the database level. Um, so it's really performant, even if you have huge amounts of data. You can do find record, you can create and update and delete records all on the database level. And then the push is really also pretty simple. You just get the data from the store, convert it into a format that your API wants, and then just post it to the API. Uh, this leads me to the next point, that transactionality is hard. Um, so we have a JSON API API, and we're generally really happy with it. However, uh, it's not really ideal for this kind of function, uh, because it's not transactional. So basically, we have a very nested data structure, and if you would submit a cupping, uh, to our server, it could have like hundreds of API requests because we have like a lot of has many relationships that all need to be posted one by one, um, which is very brittle. And like what happens if half of them succeed, then you go offline and half of them fail. It's not ideal. So what we ended up doing is we wrote a custom API endpoint just for the app, which didn't really feel great. And it takes like a custom serialized format, but it works. Um, JSON API 1.1 will hopefully include operations soon. We're waiting on it. Um, once it does, we can use it. But until then, JSON API doesn't really um, allow these kind of transactional post requests. Another thing we learned is that once you have clients that are potentially offline, you might need to make changes to other parts of your system that don't directly like, communicate with the client. So let me show you a concrete example for that. Um, so in our online system, you can create a cupping session. It has, for example, these 10 coffees. Then someone can pull this onto their device and crops the cup and start entering results. Now, what if in the meanwhile, someone goes into the online system and edits the session, maybe removes some coffees and adds other coffees, and then saves it, and then later, someone pushes their results to our server? What should we do now? Because the results that were cupped on the device are maybe not even existing anymore on the server. And it's a general like, problem for computer science, and there isn't really a perfect solution for it. Every solution kind of has the trade-offs. What we ended up going with is just disallowing editing a session once an, any device has pulled it. Um, which is also not perfect. Um, for us, the most important thing was to ensure data integrity at all cost, basically, so no data is ever lost. Um, of course, it happens that people start cupping, and then they find out, oh, damn it, it was the wrong coffee, I need to change it. And so it's not ideal. We allow people to instead clone the session and then make changes there. It kind of works, but it's not perfect. The next point, performance, um, is not necessarily specific to mobile web apps, um, but basically every performance issue you have in a regular web app is just amplified in a mobile app. And one thing that, like, not every performance metric is as important for mobile apps as others. For example, we've heard a bit, a lot of today about bundle size, and that's actually less important, I would say, in this scenario of native apps than on the web. Uh, for example, our app has, like, if you download it from the App Store, it's three megabytes, like, in total, um, which is basically smaller than any app you can find in the App Store. 
um, because it turns out that what is considered huge on the web is considered tiny in the world of native apps. Life is not fair, but that's the way it is. Um, however, what is important is rendering performance because devices are lower powered. So just to see it again, this is like a screenshot from our app. You can see that there are like a bunch of input elements and sliders and you can have multiple samples like coffees on one page. And we really spend a lot of time trying to make this really smooth. And we try to follow all the best practices like avoiding re-rendering, etc. And it got much better with uh, the Glimmer updates. However, we still had the issues on mobile devices that if you switched between pages and it started to render all the new elements, it just didn't feel great. Like it started to stutter slightly and when you would uh, scroll while changing the page, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great either. So we tried to like tweak this and find out how we can make this feel nice on a mobile device. And in the end, we kind of came to a somewhat counterintuitive um, solution, um, which worked well for us in this use case, so maybe it works well for you at some point. Uh, we ended up introducing an artificial delay for rendering. Um, so this is simplified, uh, you can read it, uh, the code. Basically, we have an each loop where we um, render, for example, five samples. And then we have this sample delayed component that takes a delay, which is just the index of the loop. So like every sample has a higher delay than the one before. And this yields the actual uh, sample that then actually shows all the input fields. And then the sample delayed component is super simple. Um, it just uses a Ember concurrency task to just wait basically for a few milliseconds and that's it. Then in the component, while it's running, we show a loading spinner and then um, once it's done, we just yield. So what does that mean in practice? All the samples basically show a loading spinner for like 100 milliseconds and just one sample is rendered at a time. Um, this really means that the CPU of the devices is always like kind of has enough resources and it never starts to hang. Yes, like it loads for a few milliseconds, but you don't really notice it. And if you scroll down, everything is always smooth. So this worked quite well for us. The next point I want to talk about is testing on real devices. So we develop on Chrome usually, and it works really well. You can do a lot of things with Chrome nowadays. It's really easy to test different sizes. Um, you can even like simulate touch events and throttle your CPU to kind of simulate lower powered devices. But this really only gets you so far. Uh, the same is true for like emulators, native emulators for iOS or Android. They are nice, you can test some things, but it doesn't give you a full picture. Um, especially for the topics of um, the actual performance and uh, scroll and touch interactions, you can really only see how they work and feel on an actual device. So basically we ended up buying a bunch of devices. Uh, we have three iPads running different versions of iOS, all the ones we support, an iPhone, a low-end Android phone, a mid-end Android phone, a Kindle Fire, and two Android tablets. And we test all our updates on all these devices. Uh, it's kind of annoying and kind of expensive, but it's really the only way to ensure that what we actually ship to our customers is like what we want them to experience. Depending on where you live, you might have the option to go to an open device lab. I don't know if you know what that is. These are places where you can kind of try things out on a variety of devices that they have there. That's really cool. Um, if you don't have this option, you should really plan for some budget to buy actual devices to do testing on. I've mentioned in the beginning that we build our app with Ember and Cordova. I'm guessing most of you probably know what Cordova is. For those who don't, it's a CLI tool to build a native app, like an iOS or Android app, um, that actually then shows a web view where you just show a web app, any web app, like an Ember app, for example. And we use this because it allows you to just develop an app with Ember, but then get it into the app stores, basically. And it then runs natively, and all the application files are local, like are included in the app bundle. And Cordova is quite nice but it was still a bit annoying in the beginning because you needed to, if you want to build an app, you need to build the Ember app, then need to take the build output, 
put it into the correct place in your Cordova project, and then build the Cordova app, and then put it on your device. It works, but it's annoying. For that, there is Corba.io, which is absolutely awesome, previously called Ember Cordova. Now it also works for Vue.js and React, I think. Um, you just install it with Yarn or NPM, doesn't matter. And then if you run Corba in it, in your project, it will set up all the Cordova things for you. And that's basically it. Then you can just use some commands provided, like Corba build or start and surf. You can even do live reloading on device. It's pretty cool. And it even helps you with tedious things like making splash screens and icons for all the different device sizes. I can really recommend it for basically any Cordova-based project. Um, another thing about Cordova, um, and actually a big advantage of Cordova over all progressive web apps, is that you can use plugins to use native level functionality from your JavaScript code. Um, there is like a billion plugins out there. We use a few of them. For example, we use Cordova plugin dialogues to show like native looking dialogues or alerts or things like that um, on the first screenshot. Then we use Cordova plugin globalization to get detailed information about the um, localization settings of the device because our app is translated in many languages and it's important that, for example, like someone in China sees the correctly translated Chinese version because they don't understand English. Not all of them, but many don't. Um, then we use Cordova plugin network information to get detailed information about the network status, like are you online, offline, how good is your connection, and Cordova plugin secure storage to store our authentication tokens in a secured place. Yeah, we also thought that basically once all our development was done, the hard work was done, but I guess we were wrong because um, I don't know how many of you have ever interacted with the Apple App Store as a developer, um, but if you have, you've probably felt like this quite often. It can be extremely frustrating. And I guess the main takeaway I want you to have for this topic is that they have all the power and you have none, and you just have to, you just have to accept the fact. Um, because it happened to us, for example, that we had a bug in our code, we quickly found it and fixed it and put the update, um, like submitted the update, but then it took like a week for them to like accept it, uh, which meant that all our users were stuck on a broken version of the app for a week and there was nothing we could do about it. Um, this basically means that of course, we never try to ship bugs in our code, but I guess we all know that it happens. And it's even more important if you build like native apps um, to try to like have a very good test coverage and make sure that you have no bugs in your code because you can't just use something like continuous deployment to just, oh, well, just push out an update. It's not that easy. Um, so yeah, really take care of that. It has gotten better in the last year or so um, now it usually just takes a day for us to get updates through, but it's still a day. And the Google Play Store is also better, it usually just takes hours. Um, but yeah, since iOS is still our primary target, we just have to deal with it. Great, we're already at my last point, which is deployment, um, meaning deployment to app stores. And it's also kind of hard. So the big problem for us is that basically everyone in our company has different computers. I develop on a Windows computer, some colleagues develop on Linux machines, and some on MacBooks. But to build an iOS app, you need to have Xcode, which means you need to have a Mac. And it was really annoying um, because I was supposed to be the primary developer of this app. Um, so we ended up having this old MacBook lying around in the office that we lovingly called Bob the Builder because we only used it to build our app. He actually looks like that. It's just an old MacBook with Ember stickers on it. Um, so you can probably imagine that it was a really annoying process. So I would develop on my computer, push the changes to Git, go to the Bob the Builder, and like get the changes, build the app, and then, oh, something doesn't work, and just repeat, repeat. It was a huge waste of time. Um, so we thought quite a long time how we could improve that, and we ended up 
getting to a pretty good place with two tools, namely Fastlane and CircleCI. So first, Fastlane is a Ruby-based command line interface tool that basically allows you to um, interact with app stores from your command line. It's really awesome. It's not necessarily like built for Cordova. It's just built like you can use it for any native app, but there is a plugin to also use it with a Cordova app. And it also has this great thing called Fastlane Match, because if you um, work with um, the Apple App Store, you need a provisioning profile to sign your app. And these can be really tricky because they can, A, they can expire or they can be revoked. And if you have to share them as a team, it can get messy quite quickly. Uh, we had a lot of issues with that. And instead, Fastlane Match allows you to, it basically stores the provisioning profile in a private Git repo and has like an API to update them or revoke them or fetch them. And with it, basically, you just don't care about it anymore. It just works. It's pretty cool. Uh, you should use it no matter if you write an actual like native native app or a hybrid app. It's really an awesome tool. Um, this is an example um, Fastlane configuration. Um, it's only slightly simplified, really, from what we actually use. So basically, you um, define lanes, and the lane then has some actions. For example, here we first um, call the match action to just ensure we have the most up-to-date provisioning profile. Then we build the app with the Cordova um, plugin. And finally, we just push it to the App Store. And it is automatically deployed to test flight, and all our testers can get it on the phone immediately, and it just works. It's really awesome. And you can just call this um, with bundler exec fastlane iOS deploy. And then we have some equivalent things for Android that looks basically the same. And it's really awesome. However, you still need a Mac, uh, MacBook or something like that to actually build this, to like execute this command um, for iOS. And for that, we use CircleCI, which is a CI tool, much like Travis. I think Travis can do basically the same thing. We just use CircleCI for no specific reason, I guess. And the nice thing is that uh, CircleCI also provides macOS machines. So we have basically set up our CircleCI workflow in a way that when we push a certain Git tag, it will automatically build once on a Linux machine where it will run the Fastlane command to deploy to the Android App Store, to the Google Play Store. And it will build once on a macOS machine where it will basically run Fastlane to deploy to the Apple App Store. And with this, we basically really never have to start up Bob the Builder again, which is sad for him, but really nice for me. Yeah, that was my talk. Thank you for your attention. I put all the resources I mentioned or used here again. I can really recommend all of them. And if you have any questions or want to talk about coffee, feel free to contact me. I also brought some stickers. They are kind of coffee related. I don't know. And yeah, thank you. <laughs>